Joining us now is the governor of the great state of Indiana and now the presumptive vice presidential nominee. Is that the proper <laughs> language? Has it hit you yet? Uh, not quite, Sean. It's uh, been very humbling, uh, very overwhelming. You know, my, uh, my grandfather came to this country in 1923, came through Ellis Island, um, drove a bus for 40 years in Chicago, Illinois. And when I called my mother uh, and told her uh, that we had accepted uh, Donald Trump's selection as vice president, there were tears on both ends of the call. This is a tremendous honor for our family. Uh, and, uh, but it's such an important time in the life of our nation, and this man is, is the right leader for America that uh, why do you, I, I why do you stepped say up that, without that, hesitation. Um, you've been watching the campaign. There are some people that I've been disappointed in. One is Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, although I've heard behind the scenes that things have gotten a lot better. Uh, some of Donald Trump's opponents, they have not come out and endorsed him. Make the case. Why, why is he the right man for the right time in your view? Well, first off, he's the people's choice. And I believe in the collective wisdom of the American people. Uh, we had a competitive primary with an enormous number of talented men and women. And Donald Trump again and again emerged because I think very much, uh, like the 40th president that you and I so, so admire, Ronald Reagan, uh, Donald Trump understands the anxiety and the aspiration of the American people like, like no leader since Reagan. And he's given voice to that. And, um, and people have rallied around him, and I believe we'll continue to rally around him. And I, I expect next week at our convention, uh, you're going to see our party and leaders in our party rally around this good man who will be a great president of the United States. Are you ready for the predictable onslaught? The Clinton campaign has said you're incredibly divisive. As a matter of fact, you are the most extreme pick in a generation. <laughs> Doesn't surprise you, right? <laughs> Well, I, you know, I'm a conservative, but I'm not in a bad mood about it. I mean, I, you know, throughout my career, I've, I've tried to stand for those, those principles of less government, less taxes, traditional values. And I've done that without apology, but I've also, I've also sought to do that in, in a way that practices civility toward others. I, in my years in Congress, my years as governor of the state of Indiana, we work with people across the aisle. And, and I expect uh, in the course of this campaign, we'll mix it up. We'll have some great debates. but. Uh, uh, after the election, when we have the opportunity to serve, we're going to work with people to solve problems facing this country, make this country safe again, and get this economy moving. You know, it's funny because you used to use that line, you were a radio talk show host. I was. For a number of years. Um, I guess that means there's hope for my future. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to interpret that. But you, already, but you said you're rush on decaf, and you said you're a conservative that's not in a bad mood. Every election, Democrats, and I guess with the statement of Clinton today, this fits the narrative that is predictable. Republicans are racist and sexist and homophobic, and they want dirty air and water, and they want to throw granny over the cliff. Do um, you think that narrative, which has worked in the past, will work this time? I really don't. Uh, I think the American people are tired of it. I think they're tired of the paralysis in Washington, D.C. They're tired of a rigged system uh, that hasn't been solving problems for everyday Americans. I think that's the reason why Donald Trump, who's gotten more than his fair share, more than his fair share of that kind of treatment from the mainstream press, uh, uh, has risen uh, in the way that he has in this time in the life of the country. The, the American people are tired of being told. Uh, we're tired of being told this is as good as it can get. We're tired of being, being told that we'll solve these problems tomorrow. We're tired of being told by elites from Wall Street to Washington, D.C., uh, how things have to be. I think, I think Donald Trump, people sense in him a strength of leadership. Uh, they're drawn to that strength of leadership, uh, and that's, I truly do believe, why he we will prevail in this election. And he did have a record number of votes, and he seems to have shattered that, that ceiling of political correctness and seems to speak his mind. 65% of Republican voters feel betrayed by Republicans in Washington. Are they justified? I think in many ways they are. Um, you know, I actually ran for Congress before the Republican Revolution. I was greatly inspired by the leadership in the late 1980s and early 90s of Newt Gingrich, uh, who is still a hero to me to this day. But I was elected to Congress, I feel like many times, like after the Republican Revolution was over. I, I arrived in Washington, D.C. in 2001, 
and bills like No Child Left Behind and the Medicare prescription drug bill and ultimately the Wall you Street voted bailout. Against those things. I, 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 I helped well, lead the fights against them. Well, I, I got the list here. You voted against TARP. You voted against repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. You voted against the Fannie and Freddie bailout. You voted against Dodd-Frank. Um, and on all of these big issues, you know, in many ways, I don't see you as establishment. You were the only person in leadership in either the House or Senate to speak at a Tea Party rally early on. And interestingly, you challenged John Boehner uh, for his job. I did. I did. Well, it was after we lost the majority in 2006, which I... I predicted. I said, I said, look, uh, we, we've lost our way. We've we've drifted off course from the ideals of Ronald Reagan and the Reagan Republican agenda uh, into big government republicanism. And you know, I always used to say, you know, if we keep spending money like the Democrats, voters are eventually going to go with the professionals. And in 2006, they did. They turned us out. So I stepped up. I, I challenged John Boehner for the leadership role in the Congress and. Uh, Eventually, I'm proud to say that I was a part of a leadership team that took the Congress back from Nancy Pelosi, and we battled against Obamacare and cap and trade and the stimulus bill before I was elected governor of Indiana. You often quote yourself as saying, I am a Christian, I'm a conservative, and a Republican in that order. That's you right. quote Reagan a lot in your speeches. You talk about the, the three-legged leg, coalition of Reagan, which is economic conservative, social conservatives, national security conservatives. Explain that. I mean, if, I were, if somebody asks me, where do I stand politically? I'm a registered conservative, but I consider myself a Reagan conservative. Yeah, I know. It's one of the reasons why I admire you so much. Oh. And, you, so uh, you, you don't hold it against me that I supported Newt, but okay, I'm glad. <laughs> you supported Ted Cruz, so that's fair. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. Well, you know, I, Ronald, Ronald Reagan's the reason I became a Republican. I mean, Same that, here. That, that, uh, that Irish immigrant that I mentioned, uh, I was named after him. I watched my father build everything that matters. He built a family, a s small business, and a good name. And I started out in politics as a Democrat. And John F. Kennedy was one of the heroes of my youth, still is. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a hero of my youth. But as I came up, I started to hear Ronald Reagan's uh, a, a capacity to articulate American ideals, and I was drawn into the Republican Party. Yeah. One of the great privileges of my life was meeting Ronald Reagan in 1988 at the White House when I was a young candidate for Congress. Um, I, I had a chance, Sean, actually to thank him for what he'd done for the country. And he would tell a small group of us a few minutes later, he said, a lot of you thank me for what I did for this country, but I want you to know I didn't do anything for this country. He said, the American people decided to right the ship and I was just the captain they put on the bridge when they did it. Well, I think they're doing it again. I think the American people are rallying around Donald Trump. They're rallying around his strength, his authenticity, his common sense conservatism, because we want to see America strong at home and abroad once again. I think, and I have said many times, when I look at the numbers, we've doubled our national debt, nearly $20 trillion. Obama will accumulate more debt than every other president before him combined. A record, 95 million Americans out of the labor force, 50 million Americans in poverty, 46 million Americans on food stamps. One in five American families don't have a single member of the family in the workforce. I view that as America in decline. To me, it, it's, the numbers seem overwhelming. What is the plan that you support that will get those people out of poverty, off of food stamps, back in the labor force, the debt down, and stop robbing our kids? Well, I think, I think the agenda that Donald Trump has articulated, the agenda that many Republicans on Capitol Hill have put forward, it's an agenda about rebuilding our military. It's an agenda that commits us to crushing ISIS, uh, not, not waiting for them to hit us and our allies, but going there and hitting them at the source. It's about securing our borders. It's about getting this economy moving again. It's about solving the problems that, are, that have resulted in this mountain range of, of debt that we're piling on our children and grandchildren. But it all, here's what it all takes. Everybody knows what the problems are. But we, what we're struggling under in this time where we've seen America's strength erode at home and abroad is a lack of leadership. And Donald Trump is a great leader. This is a man that it, I, I love. He calls himself the kid from Queens, right? You know, but it is interesting. Yeah, I mean, you're more so soft-spoken, a little less controversial. You're from the Midwest. He's from New York. Tell us about yeah. how you met and how you connected and when you knew you were under consideration. 
Well, it was just a few short weeks ago. I'd, I'd had the privilege of meeting Donald Trump a few times, and uh, I always was impressed at his cordiality, but I didn't know him very well. And a few weeks back, uh, we got a call uh, that that he was uh, impressed with the progress that we made in the state of Indiana, that he was aware of my record when I served in Washington, D.C., and wondered if I would have any interest in uh, being considered. You have uh, a $2 billion surplus? We do. Not bad. Largest tax cut in Indiana history? We've uh, actually cut taxes every year for all four years that I've been governor. That's not bad. Can you move to New York and become New York's governor <laughs> if this doesn't work out? Um, you created over 150,000 private sector jobs? That's right. Unemployment's dropped from over 8% to 5%. And, a little uh, under 5 right? We have uh, more Hoosiers working than ever before in the 200-year history of the state of Indiana today. And it's all evidence of this simple fact. Strong Republican leadership put into practice works. I call Indiana a state that works. I mean, what we've been able to do in the state of Indiana, we can do in this country. But it's going to take strong Republican leadership, uh, bringing those principles to bear, and then bringing people together. 